Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, November 6, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week I really mean it. And looks like um, my wife was kind enough to um, buy me a 12-pack of some Mountain Dew, so I'm going to go ahead and get a little jacked up with some Mountain Dew to help get it all in. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this endorsement. But that's go. You out there? Let me know. Red Bull, I think, as I said, ad nauseum, told me I was too fat. I actually did contact Red Bull, and they said, you're too fat. I'm like, all right, fine. There's a disclaimer screen. Let me sum it up for you. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. This is part of the show where I beg for a review on my book, and the reason I do that, the reason I do that is there are some malignant people in this world, as you probably know, who review the reviews. Can't imagine having that much idle time where you could review reviews, but uh, whatever. And what I mean by that is they, they didn't take time to actually read the book. They're just reviewing the reviews. Makes no sense whatsoever. But anyway, if you don't mind, throw me a bone on that. I've gotten quite a few promises from you people, and I appreciate that, but... Um, one good act is worth a thousand good attentions. I'm just saying. All right, what are we going to talk about? To oscillate or not? This morning I woke up and I'm like thinking, well, what are we going to talk about? And the, the kind of the elephant in the room is the oversold or overbought, I should say, more accurately, <laughs> nature of the market. So I started thinking about that. Um, got a last minute email or two, and is this a, I want to kind of get into. Um, value investing a little bit, believe it or not. And that's going to make a lot more sense in just a minute. Anyway, instead of telling you what I'm going to tell you or talk about, let's just start talking about it. Um, just for S and G's, you're probably shocked to see a stochastic plotted on my chart, but uh, this is just for purposes of understanding oscillators. I'm not a big fan of indicators, and I just want to show you some of the problems with, if anything, kind of want to pick it apart a little bit. Now, keep in mind, it's not my way or highway. And as I'll probably say in a few minutes or reiterate, is that if you are or do trade some sort of oscillator or something, and you've made that a big part of your life where you've studied them for years and years and years, and you have a pretty good idea how they work, when to use them, when not to use them, et cetera, sort of like I've done with just looking at price bars, and to a somewhat lesser extent, the boat boat type moving averages, then by all means use them. So it's not my way or highway. I just want to show you a few pitfalls of that uh, as far as I'm concerned. Now, once you've studied them for years and years and years, you probably have discovered some of the same things. One thing you really have to watch with an oscillator, uh, especially like a stochastic, is it's a bound oscillator. It can go, only go to 100, and it can only go to zero. Okay, so at 100, it's really going to look like a market top. So right around here, that's really going to look like a top because it's kind of hit the edge of the range. Okay, and then the market continued to go higher in this particular case, not by a whole lot. And I'm going to show you an example where it can and does go quite a bit higher. And then the same thing on the downside, it can only go to about zero. And then you have to be careful because sometimes when you get down towards, let's say, oversold, well, this market was oversold based on this dynamic right around here. And you can see it became more oversold, had a little bit of a bounce, and it became even more, more oversold. Now, it did turn around after it hit zero. And that's one of my points is that oscillators will work in oscillating markets, okay? But you have to be really careful about buying that oversold because that oversold can always become more and more and more and more oversold. And this is especially true in the short side. I'm going to flesh that out in just a few minutes. Now, notice what happened. This stochastic got super duper oversold. But then the market turned right around back up. So that makes it look like 
it's going to work pretty good. Well, the problem again is oscillators work really good when the market is oscillating. If you do use an oscillator or some sort of indicator, use it as an illustrator and not so much an indicator. Okay, like right here, say, oh, well, this market looks like it's getting a little overbought based on this run, so maybe I better just sit on my hands a little bit on the long side. And it kind of went sideways for a while. So you can see this overbought stayed overbought for a long, long time or quite a few, well, about a month or so. And then eventually the market did roll over. So if you are using an oscillator, don't say, well, I'm going to short this market because the oscillator is overbought. But then maybe say, well, wait a minute. Let me look at this market up here, whatever. Oops. And say, okay, yeah, it's overbought. So maybe you need to pay attention to what's going on with the market. But usually the best thing to do is just eyeball the overbought, oversold situation. And I'm, and I'm going to flesh this out in a little bit more detail in just a few seconds too. But this market went up about 11% from this low right here and that was about 12 days so 11 percent in 12 days round numbers is not sustainable and if you compounded that out the number would be ridiculous if it went up another 11 percent in 12 days based on a bigger number let's say so you're at 2000 then it goes up 11 percent from there then that's what another 222 points or whatever and then on top of that, you compound again. I mean, so you're talking some ridiculous number by the end of the year. If somebody has a quick way of, of running that math, uh, let me know where the uh, S&P 2000, based on a current price of roughly 2000, uh, going up 11% every 12 days would be in 250 trading days from now. And it would be, um, be pretty high, probably like 10,000 or more, okay? So there's no um, there's no it, it's not sustainable. And the reason I'm trying to multiprocess. Tom says there's no positive divergence in the September hits no buy signal. Well, I don't trade oscillators, so if you believe in positive divergences, but the problem with divergences is I see some people say you have positive divergences, some people you have negative divergences. And they use them both as the same signal, so that gets pretty confusing. But if you made your life or a big part of your life the stochastic, then by all means. And, and I'm not picking on um, Mr. Lane's indicator on purpose. It just so happens to be that one of the most common indicators, and I thought I would just throw it on the chart. It was the first one came up this morning when I went to plot an oscillator. But, yeah, if you make, if you make it a big part of your life, and say, well, you know, it's, it, this is a lower high, it's oversold, and you trade these lower highs or whatever, then by all means, knock yourself out. But the point I'm trying to make is that it can stay oversold or overbought for a long, long time. Let's go back and look at the NASDAQ in the 1999 run, in the year run in 1999. Well, the stochastic became very overbought right here, okay? And what did the market do? The market doubled, okay? So you got to be really, really careful if you're going to say, well, this market, I'm not going to buy this market while it's overbought, and then you miss that whole big leg up. And then the last little blow-off type of move that we had here, your stochastic once again became very overbought. Let me try to get this thing to line up. Oops, it's, it's a little hard to do with this pen. I'm not doing that on purpose, which is another one of the points I want to make. Um, so it got overbought there, and then the market went up another 1,000 points, okay, or eight to 900 points, whatever it was. So you got to be really careful if you're using any kind of indicator. Uh, use them as an illustrator, or if you know there is, if the market is doing something similar to the indicator, if, if the pattern fits, right? Because, like, right here it's oscillating, and right here the market's oscillating. So that looked, that actually worked pretty good, Okay. And I guess you can make the same arguments about trend following. Trend following works when it works, and when it don't, it don't. And I'm the first one to say that. But I've never found anything better after years and years of searching than trend following, okay? And if a market's going up day after 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 day, it's a market you probably want to be trading because it is trending. Now, one thing I want to point out is that you notice I was trying to draw these lines and trying to keep them straight. And it's kind of hard to do with this pen. But I've seen a lot of professional presentations where 
the bottom and the oscillators like like right here or something at the bottom of the charts like right here and then they like they their sell their buy signals look like that <laughs> it's like yeah make sure you line your signals up okay especially before you go give a presentation on how great your oscillator works a couple other things i want to talk about when it comes to indicators or oscillators first of all indicators illustrate they do not indicate there is zero predict predictive value in an indicator it simply shows you or illustrates what's actually happening or has happened I should say in the charts you then use common sense and 20 or 30 years of chart reading how long you've been at this to help you make your decision now if you're in a mean reverting type of market which we were not that long ago, okay? Market rolls over. We get a bow tie down, okay? It was a beautiful signal. Got a nice little pullback, nice little trigger. You know, first day in, hmm, begin the question like, bummer. Hey, that's a bummer. But then look what happens. The market drops about 8%. That was a pretty awesome signal. But then it gets oversold. It turns around and goes straight back up. So an oscillator is going to look like the most beautiful thing and beautiful town when the market promptly turns around. So if you get an oscillating market or a mean reverting type of market, so your mean reversion players are like, oh, I'm going to catch that falling knife. And then, wow, look how much money I made. Look how smart I am. Well, keep in mind, especially in the short side, as I'm going to flesh out here one second, that oversold can become more oversold, more oversold, more oversold, more oversold, and just keep on keeping on and it could get pretty ugly how many people here how many bear markets have you lived through okay let's see I've been through the one in 2000 I've been in the one in 2007 uh, I've been through that one uh, so that's at least two bear markets for me seems like there's been more it feels like there's been feels like there's been more uh, I've lived through the Asia crisis. Anybody remember that? Anybody here remember three? Very good, Frenchie. Frenchie's been around. None. John hasn't been through any. So if John started trading in 2009, he's probably thinking, hey, markets just go up. Now, Frenchie, on the other hand, has been through three. I've only been through two that I could think of, 2000 and 2007. Okay. But I have lived through the age of crisis. I have gone, I've had my buttocks handed to me several times in the, uh, in the, in the early 90s. Anybody here, uh, except for Frenchie, uh, remember Asia crisis, long-term capital management debacle? Anybody remember that? Okay, so these things happen to markets. The... Outliers occur much more frequently than should ever occur statistically. That's what's known as the fat tail. Now, I don't like reading about the fat tail because it's kind of depressing. But uh, what's his name? He's made a living off of writing about the fat tail. Tlaib, I think. He's the most negative guy in negative town. He basically says we're all going to blow up and die. Um, but if you want to learn about the fat tail, he's correct. He calls it the black swan. Just because you've never seen a black swan doesn't mean they don't exist. And I actually had one land, literally land in my pond and hung out for a couple days. And I've got pictures of it somewhere. But it was literally a black swan that showed up in my pond. So I know they do exist. It was kind of ironic. I had some, some issues with the hedge fund I was dealing with right around that time. So it was kind of ironic that the black swan shows up right around the outlier time. But I digress. Okay. Asian contagion, baby. You remember it? Yeah. Oh, my God. Fred remembers the bear market of 73, 74. Fred, I've met you. You're not that old. Come on. <laughs> uh, how old are you, Fred? There's no way. He's a fund manager. Has to be. Who's that? So, anyway, some things could happen. Some bad things could happen, especially on the downside, okay? 
Um, with an oscillator, you have a lot of signal, but you also have a lot of noise. Okay? So you have to be careful with that. And I started to put some charts together earlier, but I didn't want to I don't want to I don't want to turn into Mr. Anti Oscillator guy because it's not my way of highway. As somebody just pointed out, there are some things you could do with oscillators if that's your forte. If you spent years studying them and you know about divergence and stuff, then by all means use it. That's fine. Um but from where I sit, when I plot that stochastic and I back the chart way out, it looks like an electrocardiogram just kind of beeping along, okay? So you get a lot of noise, and you also get a lot of signals. You get a lot of signals that don't pan out, okay? Um, beware, again, of bound oscillators, okay? Because... Let's go back to the piece. Okay, the oscillator bottomed out here, and so did the piece within a day or so. But guess what? These piece can keep on dropping, and that oscillator is just going to go sideways because it can't go down any further. So this is going to look like a bottom, even though this continues to implode. So, again, I don't want to get in a, a pissing contest with somebody who uses oscillators, but I'm not sure how you could use an oscillator to catch a falling knife when the market is imploding. So be careful if you're in there and you have a bound oscillator, okay? Now, beware of fun and games that are played. Like I just said, I'll see like a little oscillator to bottom out, and you'll see um, you'll see like the uh, the signal up. Let me see if I can do this right. It'll make it kind of funny. You know, you'll see like the, the oscillator signal here, okay, and then they'll have that little buy signal up here. And if you draw a line, they have like a little buy arrow here. And they have like a little buy arrow in the oscillator, right? And sometimes these can be way off. You think I'm being tongue in cheek and BSing to you, but trust me, it happens. And keep this in your mind's eye, or, or write, make a little mental note of this. And if you go out and watch some webinars or go see some people in person at all, then don't call them out and be an ass, but. Pay attention to that oscillator and signal lining up, and you, you'll be surprised how many times they don't actually line up. I'm just saying, I've personally seen it, and I've been around some old timers sitting next to me, and they kind of nudge me and they go, you know, <laughs> point it out to me. There's <laughs> a bit of a skewing, okay? The signals, your signals shouldn't look like that, okay? They should line up perfectly like this. I'm just saying, okay? Now, also keep in mind, I saw a presentation once where the oscillator half the time was overbought and half the time was oversold. So flip a coin. And then they also went on to show where the oscillator was overbought for three years. And then, aha, look at that, the market rolled over. I'm like, three years? How can your timing be off by three years, you know? My time is off by a couple of days, I get in a lot of trouble, okay? First, I get pissed off. Second, my clients get mad at me. But how can you be wrong for three years and then go, aha, I was right? I, I don't get it, okay? So keep in mind, that can happen. Now, if you do find something you like, make it much of your life's focus, okay? I... Early in my career, I, I doodled around with all of this stuff. I kind of liked the 310 oscillator for a while, which is three-day moving average minus the 10-day moving average because that's something that um, I saw Linda Rasky was using, and, and I liked her stuff. And, and I sort of liked it, too. And it's kind of a cool little um, oscillator. At least I thought it was at the time. But throughout the years, I've used less and less indicators. And now I don't use any other than the occasional moving average, which I'll – 
throw in a chart only after I've looked um, at the actual chart or unless uh, I'm being paid to look at bow ties. I've had, I work with some funds over the years and they want to see bow ties with certain aspects and certain things. I'll scan for whatever you want. You just have to pay me, okay? And I'll be happy to do that for you. And I will enjoy doing it because I like doing this. But for the most part, I look at a blank chart first. In fact, all the time I look at a blank chart first. And then I might throw in an occasional moving average. But if you do find something you like, just like I've liked a couple of those little moving average, make it much of your life's focus, okay? Study that oscillator backwards and forwards. Pick it apart. Take a look at the signals, but also take a look at the noise, okay? And my problem with oscillators, indicators, or whatever you want to call it, not to pick on any particular one, but my problem is they could be like candy. It sure seems good. It sure looks pretty good on the surface because your eye tends to be drawn to these perfect bottoms and these perfect tops. But you don't see the number of times in between where that indicator was just flat out wrong, okay? So I just would caution you to be real careful with this. As I often say, and I've given this speech quite a few times, but I do the Trader's Journey speech where I talk about starting with a blank chart, and then you start adding more and more and more and more indicators. You reach a point where you can no longer see the chart. You have analysis paralysis, and then your true enlightenment becomes when you start peeling away those indicators and then you end up back in the beginning. Sometimes this journey takes about a year for some people. Sometimes it takes about 10 years for others. Sometimes it takes maybe 20 years for others. I've been in the business long enough, at least publicly, to have met some people that are just, that have been, they've been, they've been at it as long as I have and they're just slowly get they're almost back to the blank chart. They're getting there. It's taking them a while, but they're getting there, okay? What about the volatility ratio? Well, that just shows you, I talk about that sometimes too. That shows you what's already going on in the chart. And I'll talk about that every now and then. But you just come in and eyeball the chart, okay? The volatility ratio, which I wrote about in my first book, will show you when the volatility drops off. Now, volatility is measured on a closing basis. So if you have a market that's doing this, and it starts doing this, you know the volatility has gone from here and down. Okay, you could just you could look at it, but you could just eyeball the market and see that it's done that. Okay, so yeah, I don't actually plot the volatility ratio anymore. I just eyeball the chart. Okay, and I can tell you right in here. Let's connect the closes. That close, that close, that close, that close. Here's, here's a close, here's a close, there's a close, there's a close. And this one's a little bit up there, but here's another close, okay? So I can tell you just by eyeballing this chart that the volatility right here has dropped way off. And we were due for an expansion in volatility. It looks like we got a little bit of an expansion in volatility, okay? Oops, let's try to draw that again. Expansion. Now, see, now you get an expansion. Okay, so I'm just eyeballing this. Okay, you can see that the volatility was pretty tight in here. Just draw a line chart, and then the volatility began to increase here. And then what happened after the volatility began to increase? Well, the market rolled over. Then the volatility really began to increase, okay? So you don't need a indicator to tell you this. You could just... Look at another chart. But, yeah, if you were looking for a low volatility market that was due to revert back to the mean, uh, not necessarily in terms of mean reversion trading, but in terms of go from lower volatility to higher volatility, it had the potential to move, especially if you look at the trade within the trend. Yeah, but by all means, you could look for something like that or scan for something like that. But I just eyeball the charts, and again, I look for a lot of charts. But again, they can, they can be like candy. I mean, they really, really, really look good uh, on the surface. Okay? Love my first book. Thank you, Dick. Relative train versus spy. Your views appreciated. Okay.
talk about that. I remember the 73, 74 time frame. I also saw Kodak stock at the time. It was at all-time high. It started going down from there. I worked for Kodak. Well, good for you, Gary. At least you, um, at least you saw the writing on the wall. At least you saw the stock going down. Okay. Frenchie says Black Swan gone. Uh, I think he runs a fund. The problem with running a fund like that, and it would be fun to run a fund like that, is you make these bets that have the potential to have unlimited gains and limited losses. In other words, you would run out and buy a lot of options, probably like a lot of out-of-the-money options. And you will consistently lose money until you make a lot of money, okay? Now, the secret is not going bankrupt while you're losing all that money, or if you're running a fund, not losing all your clients while you're losing all that money before you have that big outlier that pays for it all. So um, it would be fun on paper to do something like that. I don't think it'd be fun. I, I said it would be fun. I don't think it'd be fun in reality because you would lose all your clients, and then, of course, an agent crisis would come up, or Ebola, or something. You know, God forbid Ebola. I should have said that, but something would come along that would scare everyone, and then the market would go nuts, and then you would pay off on those on those little bets, those lottery ticket bets. Okay. Um. Okay, I'll get to that in a minute, uh, John. Now, overbought, oversold. I know I've kind of beat the dead horse on overbought, oversold. But just use common sense. If you don't walk away with anything, just use common sense. The market can't go up 11% every 12 days forever, okay, round numbers. And that's measured from the low to the high close. The, low, the lowest low, let's count that as a reversal, an intraday reversal to the highest close, okay? And that's how I was measuring that 11% 12 days in the S&P 500. Um, there are historical, I was at a little webinar last week. In fact, it looks like I'm going to be a host of it um, on Monday. And uh, John Netto was in there, and he was pointing out some historical references. It's, historical references are fun, and they're kind of cool. And it's like the first time in 20 years, and I forget exactly what, you, what he was saying because I – I knew what he was saying was true because I'm sure he did. He obviously did research, but or he might have been quoting somebody who done the research. Either way, I'll give him credit. He had had some statistical measurement about how far the market had moved, and it's the first time it's done that in so many years, or something ridiculous. So those historical measurements can be a lot of fun. Um, but if you've been, a, if you're an old fart like me, you've been around, I'm going to be 50 years old this month, so I guess I'm not an old. Fart. I got an AARP card in the uh, mail the other day, and I, I tried to get it from my wife because I was going to go burn it. And um, she started running around with it. She took pictures of it and, and texted it to all my friends and all. And then I got to thinking, maybe I, maybe you know, maybe when I go to eat supper at 4.30, maybe I'll get some of these uh, early bird specials. So uh, I might end up keep, keep that card anyway. Anyway, my point about being an old fart is if you've been around long enough, you just remember – these moves, and you just know that this is not a normal type of move. So the statistics are fun, easy for me to say. The statistics are fun to do, just to put things in perspective. But if you look at charts long enough and you've studied the markets long enough, you know that a big move like we just had is out of the ordinary. It's one of those, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of statistics, nor do I really understand them. But I think that's what they would call the... Um, um, Three, what's that? Like a three deviation move, something out towards the end of the of the scale of the bell curve, and that we just had. Um, and always remember that overbought can become even more overbought. Uh, the um, the Nasdaq rud back in the. Um, uh, hang on, I have to take this. That was a um, that was a fund manager. He's only running about five billion, so I take his calls. Um, anyway, overbought can can become even more overbought. It, like we just showed an overbought market that doubled plus some. The Nasdaq went from whatever it was twenty five hundred to five thousand, and it was overbought most of that time. Now that's that doesn't come along that often, but it was just one of those cases where you win a rip roar bull market. And everyone was in buy, buy, buy mode. 
In fact, back then I actually had CNBC on, and they used to have a little uh, sound that they'd go buy it, buy it. You know, just that, that's a, just how stupid everything was. Now, keep in mind that oversold obviously can become even more oversold. And I put the word especially in here, okay? Because overbought becoming more overbought and staying overbought for an extended period of time, it can happen, but it's a little bit more rare than it is for an oversold market to become even more oversold. So that NASDAQ, that's one time that sticks out. There's not so many times in history that stick out in my brain. But as a trend follower, if I'm looking at a market that just keeps doing this and keeps on keeping on and I'm drawing those big arrows, then I'm not going to fight the trend because it's overbought. I'm going to buy into it. Now, but Dave, I thought you need pullbacks. Well, I do need pullbacks, but what happens is eventually – you have a rolling correction in markets like that. You start getting setups, and then they, they become uh, they become worthwhile taken, okay, even though the overall market is overbought itself. Now, here's the deal. Oversold can become even more oversold, and this is why I put especially here because um, let me see if I could put it uh, mildly. Um, shit happens, okay? So you get, let's say you get a margin call. Now, as a private trader, no big deal. But if enough private traders get margin calls, it could add to the market, okay? And sometimes it almost seems like it's government intervention, but governments try to deleverage funds, and in the process, they blow up a few, okay? Um, I've been part of hedge funds blowing up. I'm not proud to say that, but it, it's ugly. And... Um, it's, it's, it's just ugly. I'll just leave it at that. And you get forced out, and there's nothing you can do about that. Um, people panic, okay, because you might need the money, or even if you, if, you know, you always need the money. It's like somebody says, I don't need the money. It's like, bullshit. You always need money, right? Um, but let's just throw an example out there. Let's say you've got fifty thousand dollars set aside for your kids education all of a sudden the market starts tanking then you get 40 then you get 20 30 then you get 20 you know at some point what are you going to do you know are you going to send your kids to community community college or you know you better lock in some of those um lock in those losses before they get any bigger easy for me to say ah uh, there's an old adage sell first and ask questions later that's probably one of the few adages that makes a lot of sense because, believe me, that oversold can become more oversold. Now, I don't, I didn't have a, a, a good way of putting this other than the fear of going broke is much worse than what I think they call FOMO, and that's fear of missing out, okay? Um, from my MBA days, it's been a long time, so let me, let me think back. Uh, I think we call that an opportunity cost, okay? An opportunity cost is like an opportunity you're not you're you're giving up, but it doesn't really hurt your bottom line. You're just not making that extra money you would have made by taking that opportunity. So that's much it's not nearly as hard as like let's say your you own a business and starts burning down. Well, that's one thing. That's gonna create more of a panic then you're like, oh, well, I guess I missed that opportunity. Those are two different things. So the fear of missing out is not nearly as bad as the fear of going broke, okay? You feel better now, not alone. Yeah, we've. you feel better that uh, about having your, your buttocks occasionally handed to you? <laughs> All right, any questions about overbought, oversold, or... Anything we covered so far? Don't take the bait of the ARP liberal platform. Okay, I won't. I'm. I'm. Um. I rarely discuss my political views, as you know. But let's guess what I am. Uh, I've been a <laughs> a trader for 20 years. I believe in free markets, so you can probably figure it out. Heads or tail? After 10 heads in a row, what are the odds of the 11th flip coming up heads? Well, Howard, I actually took a class in combinatorics in college. And I will tell you the answer to that is 50-50. Okay? 
I was somewhere last night and they had a jar full of dice and it was five dice in the jar and for one dollar you get a roll and if you get five of any single dice like five sixes five fours five threes five twos five ones whatever you win the prize and the prize was up to 176 dollars well your second roll costs you two dollars and then your third roll costs you four dollars and it goes up um, geometrically from there each roll cost you twice as much money and I woke up thinking this morning well I actually was thinking last night too it's like well there's no sense paying for additional rolls because you're not gonna have any better chances on that second roll okay so 11 you know 10, 10 heads in a row what a chance that 11th one's gonna be ahead 50 50 now if you want to do the combinatorics of 11 heads in a row that math is a little bit different I think that's uh requires an exponential uh, 2 down 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 
or some other transitional pattern that I follow, then I'm going to be all over these. Um, I think it was February of this year, we went after the gold stocks. And we got a little swing trade out of it. We went after them again um, a few months back because it looked like they were bottom. We had some setups. And I don't, I think we either scratched out. I don't think we made any money. One of them ran up a little bit, came right back in. We didn't, we didn't make any money on it. But we scratched out. We might have lost a little bit on that. Overall, net net, we did okay in gold on the long side this year, believe it or not. But we didn't print money, okay? If that's I'm not, nothing to brag about, okay? Um, so it's going to have to make a first thrust or a bow tie. Don't worry about something never pulling back because it will pull back. Sooner or later, somebody's going to think that it's going far enough and sell some. Somebody's going to need the money and sell some. There will be some selling in a market. So don't ever feel like they're going to turn around and leave without you. But for now, you want to follow this big blue arrow, okay, and these stocks especially. Now, I want to mention something about value investing. And somebody asked me a question uh, a few minutes ago about relative strength versus the spy, and I could. There's been literally volumes and volumes written on that, so I'll try to I'll try to some, give you my Reader's Digest on that. But it kind of dovetails in with what I'm talking about. Get ready to talk about here. Value investing only works with something that has in use use, and that's the the beauty of belonging to this professional organization uh, that I belong to, the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts. And the beauty of belonging to this organization is that I get to meet a lot of these guys and guys that are much smarter than me, and I get to listen to them. And I think it was Tom McClellan. I'll give him credit. I think it was Tom McClellan. It might have been Mike Moody. But they were talking about value investing, and they just sometimes these guys could put things in, in simple terms, and it makes so much sense. Value investing only works with something that has an end use. And I'm pretty sure it was McClellan, so let's give him credit. Stocks have no end use, okay? You're not going to take your stock and, like, shove it into your gas tank or your car. And use it, okay? It has to have an end use for it to be valuable. And this morning, being that I was out of toilet paper for two days in my office, um, it was nice to see that I had a couple of rolls of toilet paper in my office this morning. And as I'm thinking about my presentation this morning, I'm thinking, well, toilet paper has an end use, uh, no pun intended. And I think that's one of the examples that came up in one of the presentations. So that's that's probably not an original thought. But let's say, I don't know what toilet paper costs. It seems like last time I bought it, it was not cheap. I was surprised at how how expensive it was. In fact, at, at that point, there were three women living in my home. And I'm like, holy moly, ladies, do you really need to go through two rolls of toilet paper a day each? <laughs> so let's just say it's not cheap. But let's say toilet paper dropped to five cents a roll. And you decide, well, I'm going to go on and buy 5,000 rolls, whatever the math on that comes to. 500 bucks worth, is that right? So you go buy 5,000 rolls of toilet paper, and if next week toilet paper goes up to 10 cents a roll, then you could sell some toilet paper, make some money, get your money back, selling half of it. Or let's say that toilet paper prices stay flat. Well, what are you going to do with all that toilet paper? Well, you got a lifetime supply or – I guess it's three months supply if you got women in your house. Um, but I digress. But it has an end use. You could use it, okay? Can you eat it? Can you use it? Can you – is there something you could do with it? Can you wear it? Okay? Then, then it has an end use, so then you could actually put a value on it, okay? I'm not a big fan of bottom fishing in any market. But let's say soybeans hit 20-year lows, 
I'm not going to bottom fish and buy soybeans, but maybe I'll keep an eye on that market for them to turn around because they're at such low levels. So commodities can have a bit of a value to them, okay? And it's hard to place that value on them, but anything that has an end use has value. So if you, like I said, if you pick up a thousand rolls of toilet paper at what you think is a bargain, then you can hang on to it and you could use it even if you don't sell it. At least it has some end use to you. At least at that point in time, it seemed like a good value. So there's some value to that. So anything that has an end use has value. A gold stock does not have an end use because it's a stock. Okay? And you could say, well, they've got so much re reserves of gold, but then you got to figure out how much they sold forward in the futures market, and, and then it just becomes a big mess. And there's no in, there's no actual physical in use for that company. You could try to value it if you want, but it has no in use. So a market or something, I should say, something only has value if it has in use. And oh, by the way, in case you wonder what in use is, I did a Google on it. Came back. It's a noun. And it's the application of function for which something is designed or for which it is ultimately used. Okay? So we might trade toilet paper, okay, but it also has an end use. Okay? Now the question is relative strength versus the S and P by or spies by views are appreciated um relative strength is a cool thing and i spent a lot of time talking about relative strength and i have a um hypothetical 100 stocks that i um track called the landry 100 I've been doing this for oh four or five years i have to go and see how long i've been doing it and this whole portfolio is ran based on relative strength so you basically rank things, and those that are ranked the highest are going to be the highest in relative strength, and those are the ones that you want in your list. And as they lose relative strength, you want to take them out of your list. So you compare, let's say you compare it to some sort of benchmark like the spiders. You don't have to compare them against a benchmark. You can compare them against themselves, and that's what I do. And all I do every day, if you took the stock selection course when I talked about how I create this momentum list, all I do, for the most part, without giving away too much, is I look at the new 52-week highs, and especially those that are making new highs on an expansion of range, okay? Those are the stocks that almost automatically go into my list, and then I kick out some a few that are underperforming. Now, volumes have been written, written about relative strength. There's a couple of things you need to know. One, when it ends, it ends badly. Okay, like I told Mike Moody at that aforementioned meeting, I'm like, hey, when it ends, it ends badly. If I could solve for that, you'd never see my fat ass again. And he kind of laughed, and, and that's when he, you've heard me say this before, that's when he started talking about if you have a baby, you're going to have baby poop. So if you're trading relative strength, it comes to the territory. It's like it's just one of the, one of the nuances. Uh, the other thing, too, is be careful on relative strength because let's say your stock's doing this. And the S&P is doing this, okay? Well, on a relative strength basis, this stock is just uh, is giving it an A-plus, okay, relative strength basis. But it's also dropping in value, and you're losing money. So just because you're losing money slower than the S&P doesn't mean you should hold on to that stock, okay? So, uh, John, we could spend hours talking about relative strength. Uh, it's fun to play around with. Just be careful. Ultimately, you want to be looking for patterns and setups and things like that. But relative strength is wonderful for keeping momentum less. So you'll see some of these uh, go-go stocks that we get in the portfolio that we're blessed with every now and then. You'll also see that those are the same stocks that are also in that uh, Landry 100. Okay. Do you mind commenting on trading pullbacks where, A, liberal entry, appropriate volatility, in a volatile market, seems to often be the area where the trade resumption fails, okay? So his point is this. 
that the he said that a liberal entry seems to be the point where a trend resumption fails. Well, it depends on the setup. If you've got a really good setup, let's say you've got a really deep pullback and liberal entry is here, well, trend resumption might might not fail until the old highs, or it might not fail at all. I mean, our goal is for it not to fail. But, yeah, if your entry is way up here, then you read the risk of that turning into like a minor double top or something. So there's some sort of Goldilocks spot in between the current market, right above that high of the current market, okay, and the old high, okay. So some sort of Goldilocks spot somewhere in between those two where let's say the market rallies but fails, it never gets to your entry. But let's say it rallies and triggers, it still could go far enough up so you at least get that partial profit, okay. So there, that's one of those things where there is no – right answer and there is no holy grail entry that we could use but you will have you will have found if you followed me over the last couple of years since the markets have gotten a little bit more choppier you will see numerous examples where i would not have triggered into positions because of liberal entries okay they look like this right here. The beauty of this is is that it's impossible to quantify, and I wish I had a very eloquent way of putting it. But let's say you miss 10 losing trades. That's hard to quantify, but that makes a huge difference in the portfolio because let's say if you got one losing trade and one mediocre trade, that's just going to scratch out. So if you got 10 losing trades that you could have avoided, this is going to have a huge difference in your portfolio. It's hard to see it at the bottom line, but if you miss enough losing trades, all you're left with is the winners. Write that down and think about that. Unfortunately, you could end up with a grill hunt if you do it, try it too much because that's what I did early on in my career when I was programming mechanical systems is I said, okay, ooh, I've got some pretty good uh, looking winning trades in here. Now I just have to eliminate all of the losers. And then I realized the error in my ways really quick after a month or two of programming <laughs> from five to seven every morning and eventually scratch my head like, oh, you can't get all, you can't get rid of all the losers. But there are things you can do like liberal entries to do them. Now, James goes on to say, two, pullback appears to be developing two legs down, but some appears to regain strength and momentum. Do you trade these? Pullback appears to develop two legs down. Well, it depends on the two legs down, okay? So and it depends on the situation. So let's say you pull them back, it goes up, and pulls back some more. If this isn't too many days, okay, in the pullback, then you still look to get long above that pivot point here. That's called a trend pivot pullback. Uh, read 10 best. That's a, that's a pattern in 10 best. Or a false rally pullback because it triggers an entry. We're over here now. It triggers an entry, then it comes back in, and then it re-triggers. And it re-trigger is what you look to take. Okay. Now, every now and then, now, in one particular case um, that comes to mind, oops, I had a uh, IPO that did this, and it took off again. I re-recommended it, like, over here somewhere. Uh, and the reason I did that, it was Zen, and we could pull it up in one second. The reason I re-recommended it was because it um, – Let's see if I can get this thing to come up. Because I thought it was still viable and also, well, personally, I was still long. And then also, um, a little discretion would have kept you in a trade. So to answer your question, this double pullback, look, I already got it marked in for you. This little double pullback here was worth taking. And it was worth taking, one, because I still saw, like, this prior signal was valid. And I saw it as an IPO, and then I had some other IPO patterns that were triggering in this particular issue, so I still thought it was worthwhile. That's the exception, not the norm. I normally don't want to trade a market that looks like that, okay? that As a general statement, I, I would not take that particular trade, but in that case, that was a bit of an aberration, okay? And that's why I, I took that trade, okay? Ooh, lots of good questions today, okay? I mean, we could we could spend um, hours on a lot of this stuff. Numbers could show anything you want. I, 
out of context. I forget where we were on that, Howard. Wait for the wait for it. Wait for bow ties off a of bottom. All are in downtrends currently. Yeah, absolutely, John. You know, I think John was talking about those gold stocks. And if you could draw a big blue arrow, then you don't want to be bottom fishing. And when we get to the charts here in, in a few minutes, you're going to see that even gold, the commodity, which you could argue has an end use, would have been a bad idea to bottom fish in there. Okay. It's all in how you present something. Well, Howard, what are you talking about, though? I don't know which you kind of lost me on that. And my apologies because these questions come in and I'm I'm busy I'm busy uh, filibustering away, pontificating. I think sounds better. Please talk about trading a raising mid cap stock in a raising sector where the S and P index is going down. Well, I don't look at a stock and say it's a it's a mid cap and then it's a it's a mid cap sector or it did, or whatever. I just say, is the stock set up? Yes. Or are the stocks within the sector set up? Yes. Is the overall sector set up or is the overall sector at least trending? And if the answer is yes, then it's probably a 99.9% .9 chance I'll take the stock. Is the overall market also trending? Maybe. If it is, then, then I know I'll take the stock, okay? So if I've got the sector and I've got the stock and I've got stocks within the sector trending or set up, and I can't, and I'm finding other stocks that look almost as good as the one I'm, I'm, I'm looking to get in. And the overall market is there, market sector stock. If all three pieces fit, then I'm going to be all over it. Once a year, once every couple of years, it doesn't happen often. You might see me write a column. If you go back to way back to the trading market days, when I was with trading markets, um, you'll see that every now and then I'd write a column and I'd show that a persistent pullback in the P's, a persistent pullback in the individual sector, and a persistent pullback in the stock within that sector. And um, don't quote me on this because I, I hate to never say never, but from memory, I have never seen one of those trades not work. Now, that's a double negative or triple negative, I forget. But if you've got a persistent pullback at all three, then chances are pretty darn good it's going to work. So I'm not worried if it's a big cap stock or small cap stock, or I'm not going to look within the mid cap sector of the S&P or the mid that whatever that mid cap index is. I'm just going to look to see if the market in general is going up, the stock in general is going up, and the sector in general is going up, and then I have that set up. Now, with all those caveats out there, if I really, 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 really like a setup, then I'm going to take it. I don't care about everything else. But the more pieces that fit, the better off you are, okay? If the pieces don't fit, don't take it. My questions just got wiped out. Huh. All right, let's uh, finish up a little bit. Uh, somebody asked me about seasonal biases, and my canned answer there is that you don't have a representative sample, okay? Let's, let's, let's assume the markets in the U.S. have been traded about 100 years, which is yeah, about right, probably, liquid enough to trade, maybe a little bit more. And let's say you got some kind of seasonal bias. It's like eighty percent of the time, okay? Well, this could be wrong for many, 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 many years. It could be wrong for four or five years, and still be statistically valid. Unfortunately, you don't have a representative sample. That's my problem with seasonal biases, okay? So what you need to do is say: Is the market going up? Yes. Then it's going up. Does it matter if it's a Santa Claus rally? or uh, Ebola has been cured, or Republicans are in, Republicans are out. It doesn't matter. No. No, it's going up. Okay? It's starting to sound like Nicholas there. Is it going down? Okay? Does it matter why it's going down? No. Okay? Is it going sideways? And that's all you need to know. And then if you look at the back of my business card, that's there. Now, the big deal about the Republicans, okay? Republicans gain control. All right. Well, now what? So the market rallies a little bit, but you're going to see that you have these news events and then it becomes a now what in markets, okay? Uh, this is left in from last week. Somebody asked me about liberal entries, and I think I don't remember exactly what the entry was in here, but it certainly wasn't like right underneath like this low, okay, or this low here because you got triggered there, you got triggered there, uh, you got triggered here. And by using a liberal entry like here or here, and then as it went higher here, 
you avoid a losing trade altogether. Okay. All right, a couple of announcements. Um, if you like these shows, you're going to love the flash drives. Uh, 2014, what I'm doing there is I'm just consolidating the entire year. So volume one is going to be almost the entire. In fact, what I'll also do is if you get volume one, I'll give you the whole year. And I'll make the uh, recordings available to you. Or if you send me a self-addressed stamped envelope, I'll refill that drive with the entire year's worth of stuff. And this is just up until June, okay, uh, all this stuff in here. So a lot of stuff comes up out in these um, webinars. And there's a lot of stuff that's not listed. Like today, we talked a lot about relative strength, which probably won't even get listed as uh, part of the topics for today. Um, I need to correct this slide here. The um, Right now, with the stock selection course, this should be course, uh, you get one year to my trading service free, okay? And that's, uh, so far, I've, I've kept that offer. I don't know how long I'm going to run that, but for now, I'm just, I'll am just i probably run it until the end of the year. So if you're interested in the stock selection course, which a lot of the things we talk about in here, persistency and looking for patterns and set us within the patterns and picking the best stocks and, and momentum, which we just talked a lot about, or relative strength, you want to look at it like that, all those things. Uh, it's like 14 hours of stuff. So that's in there. So check that out. Uh, if you're interested in a trading service in and of itself, I do have a low introductory rate. And I do a lot of work daily. Uh, and that's one reason that I have the educational business and I have a trading service business is I throw off a lot of excess research. I can't always act and or trade on everything I find in the market. So that excess research becomes part of my trading service and I do a lot of research every day so I'm spending several hours a day looking at thousands of charts looking for opportunities for myself and in the process a lot of stuff gets thrown off from that a lot of very usable and tradable stuff and a lot of good information so if I say so myself anyway check that out if you're interested now let's take a look at uh, oh by the way that's the back of my business card send me a self-addressed stamped envelope uh, email me if you need my address. It's it's also in the bottom of the newsletter every day. So if you need look at the bottom of the last newsletter. You get lost in the markets, flip the card over. Okay. Somebody sent me ten bucks in a in an envelope. I'm always welcome cash. They got a little help from me personally. So feel free to send me cash too. That's fine with me. Alright, let's talk about the overall market. Was that an outside thought? Um Let's take a look at the S&P first, and let's go ahead and open it up for individual stock questions. Uh, only only thing I ask is, if you want to ask about 10 stocks, just ask about them one at a time. Looks like we just blew something up here. I usually try to reboot before the shows. The last time I did that, it had to do like a um, it had to do like a 20 minute uh, update. Hey, Don's here. What could Don possibly want to know about? Let's get that thing uh, reloaded. Yeah, just ask about one stock at a time when you ask about stocks. Let's take a look at the overall market, and then we'll work our way into the uh, sectors. Um, the S&P is just kind of hanging in there. Uh, it's up a smidge today. I wouldn't get too excited about that. One thing I, I noticed, and if you've been to these shows, you know that I often um, talk about the micro and then work my way into the macro. On a uh, micro level, you could see that we really haven't made any forward progress in about four days here, okay? So if we just have a modest down day, then we could actually have a down week. Um, the aforementioned webinar, which looks like I'll be hosting on, on Monday. So keep an eye out for an email, uh, maybe tomorrow, um, on, on that webinar. 
and it'll be with a group of other traders, and, and just keep an eye out for that. But uh, we were asked, you know, where's the market going to be a, a week from now? And, and I don't like doing those kind of things because it's just a guess at best. Um, but I guess down, I guess lower. So I guess the market would end the week lower from uh, from Monday. And as a trend follower, I'm a little torn because it's obviously headed higher. But I figured it's overbought nature. It's due to correct. It would correct between now and Friday. Well, I got one day left to be right. I guess I was right for one day. Uh, but anyway, that kind of stuff, it gets you a lot of trouble really fast. Be careful with uh, predictions. Somebody sent me a good quote right before I got started, but I couldn't get their permission in time to, to, to quote them. So I'm going to quote them next week um, on the uh, taking things one day at a time uh, and not trying to predict too far out or predict at all. Uh, he's, he basically said to observe and not predict, which I thought was brilliant. Absolutely. So we lost a little steam in here because, well, just look at where the market has gone straight up in here. And let's take a look at like a line chart. Just for, I never look at line charts that often, but sometimes I think it's, it's kind of cool to look at a line chart. Let's see what we got. A line chart is uh, closes only. And they, they do have some use, okay? Uh, sometimes the market will make a new stealthy closing high, but you can see this market has pretty much gone straight up from here to here, and then now on the line chart, you've got a little bit of drift in here. So it's lost a little bit of steam just based on that dynamic alone. I wouldn't get too excited just yet. Like I preached a few minutes ago, overbought can always become more and more and more and more overbought. Okay. You can only predict the markets in hindsight. Yeah, I agree that. Okay. But what you could do is if you have, for instance, like we talked about the bow tie, you get a back to back bow tie off of all time highs, then the signal here, that's a pretty powerful signal. Now the market dropped about eight percent out of that. So that's a pretty good trade. Uh although it didn't turn into mother all tops. It could have, but we don't know. And that's why we followed it down, took some profits, and then got stopped out on the remainder. Okay. So S&P kind of just drifting higher in here, Flatsville today so far. Uh, super duper overbought. Notice that we really didn't take out this prior high too much. And notice that we really didn't take out the July high too much yet either. Okay. So if you could avoid all this fluff in the market and just kind of look at what's going on, okay, you can see that so far we haven't made a whole lot of forward progress, or I should say lately we haven't made a whole lot of forward progress. So it's kind of hard to get excited about a market. You know, you, you look at this and you get all excited, but then you look at back the chart out a little bit, and it's a little bit harder to get excited about the market because we really hadn't cleared this peak or this peak decisively just yet. But, hey, one day at a time. All right, NASDAQ, uh, big V-shaped recovery at high levels. As I said, quite a bit. By the time you get all the way back to the old highs, this market is already overbought, okay? Now, I'm often asked who they are. I even wrote a column called The Usual Suspects, okay? And they are the market participants. Well, down here you got your reversions to the mean players, uh, maybe some value players. I can't imagine that a value player would see a market at these high levels, even after the sell-off, as a value. But some bottom fishers, for lack of a better name, or reversions to mean traders, came in probably around 4,100 or 1,800, I guess, in the piece. But are they left to buy up here? Well, there's no bottom fish who's going to bottom. You can't bottom fish at the top, right? And then the other thing is you probably had some shorts that got squeezed out, present company included, okay? So by now, most all of the shorts have been squeezed out. You have some, We have a couple left, but for the most part, I think most people have been squeezed out by now. So that buying has exhausted itself. So I'm not trying to think about who they is too much and try to quantify that, but I could tell you, um, by watching the charts, look at the charts that we're overbought, and then those people have likely bought. Now, notice the NASDAQ losing a little steam. Well, how do I know? Well, we got, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five days without much forward progress. 
in here. One, two, three, four. And then tomorrow we could actually have a down week in a NASDAQ. Okay. And maybe the P's too. Who knows? Uh, if we pull back below these double tops in here or this prior top in here, then I would begin to get concerned. So ideally, I'd like to see a blow-off move. I'd like to see overbought just become super-duper overbought and then look to play some pullbacks along the way. Russell 2000, Russell 2000, I said, would have a hard time getting through that year's worth of trading, okay? But it turned around and went straight back up. Now, you're going to find when a market breaks out of a range, the longer and the further it could stay below that range, the harder it will be to get back through that range. In the case of the Russell, it only stayed down about a week, and then it just went straight back up. So it's like sometimes the market's given a do-over. When it breaks out of a range, it comes right back in. And that's because these people who bought for the last year and a half don't have time to react, and they're like, oh, wait, the market's going down. Oh, no, it's right back. Okay. So they're a little slow to react, so that's why that tends to work. Keep in mind that everything I say or do has some sort of uh, conceptually correct backing to it. I'm thinking of the psychology of the market participants when I talk about something. Okay, so if it sells off hard, it comes right back. Everybody breathes, breathes a collective sigh of relief. And to my amazement, this uh, Russell just went straight through most of this overhead supply like butter. Well, in the markets, it's like Janet Jackson says, you know, what have you done for me lately? I think there's only Frenchie's the only one in here old enough to remember that probably. A couple of you guys, I guess. Anyway, you can see so far it's lost a little bit of steam, kind of pulling back a little bit but also has a lot of overhead supply and such to overcome. Now, this is gold. This is why we don't bottom fish at gold, okay? Now, you do take signals, like I said, like right there, that was a signal. You might have had a signal in here somewhere. I think it was in February. It's worth a shot, okay? It was shaping up recently, and no, it came right back in. But you don't try to buy just because it's low, because lower, low could always become lower, and that's the whole speech about the um, – Over what over zone. Uh, some of these areas in here are just kind of bouncing around, getting a little choppy, like the chemicals. Energies, for instance, kind of interesting that they pull back, but now they're about a month. There's about a month's worth of trading in here where they've kind of gone mostly sideways. So even though it looks like they pull back and they're poised to make a new leg lower, I'm not really seeing a whole lot of setups there. Anything. Um, Health and health service related has been doing exceptionally well, as you know. The drugs have begun to pull back a little bit. One of the things that concerned me was biotech's pulling back in here, and that looks okay. That's no problem with that. It broke out of a base, pulling back a little bit, a little bit of a V-shaped recovery, but not too bad, okay, not too deep of a V. And so far it's pulled back looking okay. But what concerned me was if you dig within biotech, there were some debacle de jours yesterday, some stocks that really got whacked in here. So that's why I wrote a little bit about the canary in the coal mine, okay? Uh, most areas have come back sharply like the overall market. Insurance was just making new highs in here. That's one of those areas that came back with a vengeance. Banks were coming back, and they're stalling out a little bit in here, but you take a look at like the regional banks. They've been doing pretty good in here. They're kind of going straight up. For the most part, I'm not going to bore you too much. Most sectors are doing pretty good. There's some in here that were, and maybe were is the key word in that sentence, but like utilities, Sleepy old utilities and REITs, real estate, that is, were actually making new highs uh, and doing it with such a vigor, they're acting more like momentum stocks than the sleepy stocks that they normally are, okay? So that's kind of interesting. Now, whether or not we'll see setups there, whether or not we'll take them, remains to be seen. Uh, I don't see any reason to beat the sector action to death. You could go through these sectors on your own, too. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Some areas like retail, which looked like they were just all over the place, and imploding, just turn around and have gone right back up. Transport's another one of those areas. Uh, same sort of action there in some cases, the big V-shaped recovery. But you can see it's kind of losing a little steam in here as of late. So I think it's a developing situation. I think it's worth watching. And what's amazing is if you look what they did, like the, the transports, like regional airs, even major airs, have been doing exceptionally well in here. So I find that kind of interesting. In fact, we actually had a... Um, one from last week we showed as a possible um, uh, avoided entry or as an actual avoided entry. Now, Don's here. Can't imagine what the frick he wants to know about. Ah, uh, Ford. 
Well, Don, we got your bow tie here marked up. Uh, not that I recommend the trade again, or sort of a blow, bow tie, kind of sloppy form. But you can see it had a nice little sell-off out of that so far. Um, yeah, let's draw an arrow. Looks like it's headed lower. So I uh, certainly don't want to bottom fish there. Okay. Apple? Eh. Apple's back towards Zoll Highs. It's doing okay in here. That's not something that I would go after. But I guess as a trend follower, if it did pull back a little bit more, because it did break out of a base, okay? Um, as I said before, sometimes you wait for a base, you wait for the breakdown out of the base, and then you look to buy when it comes through the base the other way. And that works for longs and shorts. So based on that, it's doing okay. It's in a nice trend. A little bit more pullback, maybe a pullback to 106, 105. It might be worth a shot. I'm just not a huge fan of trading these huge thick stocks. Also notice that the volatility has calmed down quite a bit. It's now at 22. In general, I'm not a big fan in this particular market, at least, of trading stocks with an HV of less than 30. UFS transitional for Calvin. UFS. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Let's take a look at what uh, you might be seeing there. Uh, he's seeing a bow tie, that's for sure. And it's off of uh, multi-year lows. Ideally, you want that to be off all-time lows. So, so far, so good there. Um, what is this, the toilet paper company? Yeah, so, so far, so good. It's triggered a bow tie. I wouldn't take the trade now because it hasn't actually panned out. But I hear you, and I think that's a good, uh, good eye on that one. I think that's definitely a stock that has bottomed out. Okay, SWIR on a pullback, Swear. Uh, no, uh, it's it's too extreme of a move. It's a 25% move, okay? A lot of times these big moves like this, relative to the volatility of the stock, it can be like a one-and-done type of move. So for me, it's going to be hard for me to get excited about that stock after such a big move like that, okay? Not that it can't go higher, but it's not something I'm interested in. Breakout entries, what do you mean, John? Bob on a pullback, maybe. I mean, you know, it's one of those, I'm going to candidate in Louisiana, just close your eyes and vote for me. It's like, okay, it's kind of how I felt in this election, just close your eyes and vote. <laughs> but I digress, because um, it's such a stupid company. But, hey, I'm a trend following one, right? Yeah, it's up at new highs on a pullback, possibly, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing, you know. I thought Bob was the stupidest, stupidest stock at Stupid Town, and it went straight down for a few weeks. And it's like, you see, that's why I recommend not buying an IPO right out the gate. You'd have lost a considerable amount of your money, maybe 20% of your money or so. But now that it's proving itself, maybe on a pullback, it might be worthwhile. Now, if this was a cheaper stock, it would already actually be along. And I don't want to get into those details um, out of courtesy for those who um, were at the course. CSG for Andre. CSG. Uh, yeah, it's bottoming out. You know, here's the deal. It's a REIT. Um, a lot of REITs have gone straight up as of late. Maybe maybe this is like the last of the ones, um, what do you call it, when pigs fly? You know, maybe that's what's going on. But you've already had your bottoming action. You've already had your bow tie. I'm just not a big fan of REITs. Notice the HV is 18, pretty low. Uh, but I hear you. And if, if if these REITs keep going straight up, we might be forced to trade REITs. Um, I think I would pass. I mean, this move from here, 740, all the way up to here, it's not even one point. Um, but I hear you. It's, actually, it's bottomed out. I just don't – I can't get that excited about that stock. It's just not jumping out at me. Short sand desk, SNDK, why not? SNDK. Uh, no, too many days at the pullback. And that's the problem we're up against now is that, you know, a client this morning emailed me, goes, Dave, you you act like we're going to see setups soon. It's like, well, I'll just take things one day at a time, and I would imagine that we're due to start seeing some setups. But his point was that you're not going to see shorts because the market would have to roll over. That might take a, a while. And you're not going to see longs because the market's going to have to keep on going higher and then pull back, and that might take a while. And you know, the bottom line is, don't think too much. Just do your analysis every day and see what comes up. But I hear you. 
Well, the problem is what I'm getting to on the short side is now you've got all these stocks, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. You know, you got about a month's worth of trading like the energies where they just kind of pull back. They're probably still in trouble, but it's no longer set up based on my methodology. But, yeah, back to chart way out. Yeah, it looks like it's in trouble still. LCI in a pullback. LCI in a pullback. No, because you, you broke out past your prior peak. And see, this is where the stock selection course comes in. Not to soft sell it, but we talk about a lot of these things where you have a prior peak, and that's one of those patterns you want to avoid because then you end up with the potential for a double top. Okay, You don't want to just look at this part of the chart here. You want to take it in context with the rest of the chart. Okay, Now, it doesn't mean the stock can't go up, but the point is why not find something better? Okay. Uh, how do I get volatility up here? You uh, right click on it or left click, uh, left click on it, and you click on Edit Field, and then you put the uh, indicator in the field. And if you need the indicator, I'll give it to you. Um, I think once you have the PCF written, you just select the PCF that you want, and then it goes in that field. Okay. Zayo. That's going to be an IPO. Um, there's nothing to attract me to the stock just yet. If it was a little lower, there's a breakout characteristic that I follow. But it's worth putting on your radar and watching it. A little bit thin, though, kind of thin, so be careful with that. Um, it really hasn't rallied that much. I'd like to see a little bit more rally and then maybe on a pullback. So almost to a point, Stephen, where I would treat it like the um, – core methodology, FRGI, uh, well, it's kind of a thinner stock, so be careful. Now, I'm more lenient in the thinner stocks when it comes to the IPOs. I think we talked about that last week. Uh, my problem here is it's broken out, and that's a good thing, but now it's pulled back almost all the way to its prior breakout levels. So it's almost like that entire breakout has been negated. So I would leave it alone based on that dynamic alone. Twitter for Don. Don, it's not set up. Okay. Well, the intermediate blue arrow, or green arrow, I guess in this case, points down. And then it's just kind of wide and loose longer term, so it's not a setup. H-C-K-T. That does not sound for me. Is it Hockett? something hack it um yeah it's super thin okay i know you like to trade those thin stocks andre and you can uh that's fine the problem is it's kind of a bottle rocket in here it's kind of going straight up um but it's it's not too extreme maybe on a pullback but it's too thin if it had a lot more structure to it then maybe we could talk about it further but uh it's just kind of just one big bar up so far i wouldn't get too excited about that just yet awk um, yeah, absolutely. Um, bit of a TKO type of move. That's not bad. I mean, it's utility. It's kind of hard to get excited about utility. HV is pretty low. Um, I would much rather trade a more volatile stock than a less volatile stock. And you think, okay, well, Dave, your risk is going to be a lot more in a volatile stock. And no, it's not because you're going to adjust your share size accordingly in the more volatile stock. And you could easily end up if you're trading less volatile stocks, you could easily end up with a position size four times the size of your less volatile stock, okay? Because when you're adjusting for, let's say you use a four-point stop in a particular stock, okay? But you might use a one-point stop in a less volatile stock. Well, guess what? You're going to have four times bigger position in a less volatile stock. And if something bad happens... Like I often write, let's say the CEO gets involved with an ex-porn star, right? That happened two days after my book went to the printer, okay? Then that sleepy little non-volatile stock all becomes, uh, overnight becomes very volatile. And I forget how much of shareholder wealth was decimated by it. I'm actually writing about it in, in, in a chapter on a book I'm working on. But it was something ridiculous like, I want to say half a billion. That sounds like too much. But I know it was in the hundreds of millions, so it's a couple hundred million here, a couple hundred million there. Before you know it, 
begins to add up. So he wa he wiped out millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of shareholder wealth just by his indiscretion. Amazing, isn't it? Okay. I mean, that's that's a testament for not trading low volatility stocks because something, something bad could always happen. Eros, E R O S. Uh, no, I'm not seeing much to get excited. It kind of broke out. It hadn't really taken off just yet. I mean, this thing's almost going to have to, I don't know, it's going to have to take off a little more. It's kind of choppy. It's kind of thin. Um, it just doesn't jump out of me as something I don't want to trade. Okay. But maybe if it could kind of get its act together, you know, pull back a little bit in here. Um, ideally, though, I'd almost like to see it blast higher and then pull back. So I'm going to pass on that one. Yahoo. Well, Yahoo's a real thick stock, so I'm not a huge fan of thick stocks. But every now and then, a thick stock can set up. Uh, it looks okay. It would have to pull back. But if it pulls back, it's going to pull back to this prior peak. So it's not it's not ready yet, okay? But, yeah, if you want to put it on your momentum list, by all means. CDK. CDK. Yeah, it looks pretty good. That's actually... Uh, on a pullback, okay? On a pullback. OMCL for John. OMCL. OMCL. Are we talking about this one already? Yeah, it looks familiar. Uh, it's just kind of going straight up. So let it pull back a little bit, but then it barely cleared this. It really didn't clear this prior peak by that much. You know, these are some really choppy ones in here. Let's let's try to find something a little bit better. AGIO. Yeah, there you go. That's looking better. Who 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 said that? Good job, whoever you are. I'm sorry I didn't get your name, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you got you got some acceleration. Maybe a tiny bit more pullback. Not too much though. Just maybe a little bit more pullback. And you might have yourself a good-looking stock there. Absolutely. It's it's, it's, it's kind of wide, loose, longer term, but uh, it's kind of gotten its act together in more recent times. Kate. I got a bad tick on that one, but um, let's see if we can get rid of it. Or is that too bad? Kate? Wait a minute. I was thinking of some other stock. No. Look at this big, ugly bar down. And now it's going, it's just had one big bar up. It's all over the place. And then it's going to hit a mound of overhead supply. No. It's too late for Nicholas, but I'd, I'd take him out if uh, it wasn't so late. Nicholas, fine. Yeah, this looks like a short, but, again, you've got a month's worth of pulling back, so it's too many days of the pullback. But uh, back to chart out, eh, it's still at fairly high levels. It looks like a short. It looks like it's headed lower, but it's not a setup for me. Okay. LL, we talk about that one? Is that lands in? No, lumber liquidate is no. You got a big gap down. It went sideways forever. Now it's trying to come back up. Um, no, it's nothing to do there. It's nothing uh, that needs to be done. I should say. SPR with a buy stop at the high. All right, Stephen. Nice. Uh, I like the way you tell me the whole deal. Let's see. Uh no, because you barely got past this prior little peak in here. Uh, let's take a look at like save maybe. What's it look like? Oops. No, save really didn't get past the prior peak either. CHK for a short. CHK. The charts are kind of messed up, by the way. It's not your stock picking. It's um, the charts are just messed up. I'm not because see like this Chesapeake. Well, first of all, you got a gap, a big gap against the trend. A little gap against the trend is okay in a commodity related stock. Write that down. But a big gap, you got to be a little suspect. And now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. you got about a month's worth of trading in here. So it's too many days of the pullback, okay? And then also in the energies, you want to try to find energies that are like rolling over like this one did way up here as opposed to find the ones that have already halved or more in value on the way down. CSG and DOC. G. Did we talk about this one? I think we did. Uh, DOC. Um, it's kind of choppy longer term. It would really have to get its act together. 
Uh, maybe if it had a little bit more breakout on a pullback, I think you could find better though. AWK is going to be utility. And we're going to have to wrap things up. Uh, yeah, on a bit of a pullback, we talked about this one already. This one's okay as it is because it's. T I did see this this bottom tick here. It's a TKO, but keep in mind it's only got an HV of 16. It's only moved a couple of points in here, and like I said earlier, to get your math right, you're going to have to buy a lot of shares of this stock, and something bad can always happen, even in a lower volatility stock. Okay. Well, look, uh, we're at an hour and a half, so let me go ahead and wrap things up so we can manage the recording here. I love doing these shows, as you can tell. I appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your appearance. So thank you so much for being here. Anything unanswered, Dave at DaveLander.com, or anything needs a little bit more uh, explanation, shoot me an email. I'll be happy to do that. And I'll either answer you directly or it'll be fodder for next week's show. But either way, you'll get an answer. Uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk again. And um, I guess uh, we'll see you again next week. Thank you so much.